5.30 now, and has to pee. So I go and take him to pee. Oh, hello, speak of the devil. Hello. Come here. I found a rubber band. You found a rubber band? Yeah. I think that's a hair band for your mom. No, that's for me. Want me to put it on your head? No. No? All right. Can you say hello to everybody? Hey, look, I put it on your head. Watch this. I know. Watch it. It's going to be cute. It's going to be cute. No. Are right. you? Okay, fine. Um, Can you tell everyone that you're having a great day? Oh. Did you finish school yesterday? Hmm. You have a party today, huh? Final day party. But I have a question. What? Star Wars with Dad. You like Star Wars with Dad? Mm -hmm. Oh, I like Star Wars with you, too. All right. Go out there and be good with Mommy, okay? Today's Daddy Day. No, yesterday was Daddy Day. Today's Mommy Day. Okay, Dad. Hey, look, I took it off. You took it off? Okay, bye-bye. See you. Please keep it open. No, I gotta shut it. Bye. Okay. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm great. Tired, but great. Final day party live or online? Online. It's not such a great party if it's online, in my opinion, but... That's okay. He's going to make cookies with his mom. Is James a Jedi or a Sith? James thinks anyone with a lightsaber is a bad guy. But I asked him his favorite superhero. That was the question in school yesterday. And he said, the Emperor. <laughs> so uh, he enjoys the Emperor. Any tips for beginners? Yeah, learn to play well. Check out pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. There we have a fundamentals course that will get you up to speed so that you learn how to play reasonably well. Today, though, we're going to be discussing pregame routine and staying focused. This is something that a lot of you ask me about, so I figure we might as well discuss it. Man, my hair is getting long and floppy. Do I just shave my head? Next time you all see me, I may have no hair. Oh, my goodness. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it? 10 is terrible, 1 is acceptable. No, is that or is it the opposite? 10 is really bad, 1 is okay. Long and floppy, indeed. Um, so, pregame routine. First things first. First things first. What is your purpose for playing poker? What's your purpose for playing poker? And I think a lot of people think that their purpose is to play to the best of their ability and try to win the game. But, at the same time, that's actually not most people's purpose. Most people play games, and poker is a game, for a few reasons. Um, one is to, um, to, to experience social interactions, to be able to go there and do something, to go and have an experience. Um, other people play to try to break the game, to try to experience the uh, big bluffs and the big folds, etc., etc. And then people play poker to make money. Okay? Goodness gracious. So, you have to figure out where you actually are. And if you say, oh, I play poker to make money. Okay. It's easy to figure out if that's actually what you're doing based on how much time you devote to poker. If you are not studying poker every day or the vast majority of days, you are not playing to make money. You are playing for fun. And that's okay. And it's also okay to be a serious recreational player, but understand that you are not going to experience, well, professional level results if you take it not so seriously. And that is okay. Next, you have to ask yourself, if I am playing this game recreationally, do I really actually care about results? And you may. You may, you may not. I'm not sure. But essentially, you want to figure out why you're playing, and if you care about pregame routine, focus, etc., I have to presume you are trying your best to maximize your EV, your expected value. Now, how do you determine expected value? Is it all in dollars? Well, for some people it is, some people it isn't. Some people get an immense amount of joy out of winning tournaments. All they really want to do is win. They don't care if they get a min cash. They want to win the tournament. For them, they value, well, I guess, accolades over dollars. And that's okay. But it's not going to win you the most money. That said, you really want to understand what you are actually trying to accomplish. You need to try to accomplish... Well, you want, you want to set up yourself to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. So, I'm going to discuss how to do that in just a second. Let's go through your comments. Did I see Shannon Schwartz's interview? He talked about me and him working back in the day. I did not see that interview yet, but I'll check it out. I was also on that same interview a few weeks ago. 
that's called The Hero's Journey. So check out that podcast. Have I been profitable in ACR tournaments? I um, am up a lot of buy-ins. I'm down some amount of money, some small amount, like 5 or 10K. You may say, how can you be up in buy-ins but down in dollars? Well, they have random $2,500 tournaments, and I've lost every $2,500 tournament. I think seven of them so far. And I've won a bunch of $100 and $200 and $600 tournaments. Turns out, though, when you lose buy-ins that are uh, five times or ten times the other buy-ins you're playing, it's easy to be down dollars. And that's actually how live poker goes, too. Um, whenever I was playing live poker a lot, I would win basically two or three tournaments every year. may not sound like a lot, but it actually is. And if you won the $10,000 tournaments, you got rich. If you won the $500 tournaments, you had a terrible year and you got slaughtered. But you still win the same amount of tournaments. You know, All you can do is show up and play great. Some of you say I need a haircut, some of you don't. That sounds about right. Signed up for the tournament challenge. Great. You realize you need to do the fundamentals course first. Good. Speaking of consistently studying, check out pokercoaching.com slash tournament challenge right now because if you have not already gone through the first, uh, what, nine or ten days of that, you're behind. You need to get caught up, but you can definitely get caught up. Is it better to bet tiny or check to induce a bluff? It depends on your opponent. What does your opponent perceive to be weak? Is my first book still relevant? It actually is. Do I use Adderall or Snow? No. No, and I don't even know what Snow is. No and no. Faraz Jaka took down a big one the other day. Yeah, he took, I think, uh, second place or something in some $1,000 tournament. A big one, too. Poker Coach and Premium members got to watch Faraz stream the other day. Um, he actually ended up taking a third place in that session, although it happened after the stream ended. But he'll be reviewing that for Poker Coaching students later. What's the topic for today? Pre-game routine and staying focused. All right, back to focus. How do I stay focused? Well, first things first, I have an immense amount of experience playing poker, okay? It is not something that I personally have to get in the zone for because, like, if you told me there was a $10,000 buy-in tournament happening right now down the street that I thought I'd be profitable in, I would get dressed and I would go play the poker tournament. There would be no pre-game pre -game required. It would just be get up and go. And would I be playing my absolute most profitable poker? Um, maybe, maybe not. Obviously, it'd be a little bit frantic, which is not ideal. Um, but it would be fine. Maybe playing like 95% capacity. That's because we've done this for a very long period of time. And I realize that's not the case for most people. Most people get very excited, they get very anxious, they get nervous, they feel something when they go to do gambling games or play poker, right? Or do anything, you go out on a first date with someone, you, you get excited, right? And that's because you haven't done it a whole lot. There's this idea of biological conditioning that if you do something enough, you'll eventually get used to it. And um, I think it's gonna sound kind of rough, but you need to get good at failing or losing to be very comfortable going to play poker and not having lots of emotions running through your head. So how to get used to losing? Well, lose a lot. I was very fortunate that I played a lot of games as a young person. I played a lot of chess with my dad. He beat me until I learned to beat him. I had friends who played chess who were better than me. They beat me. Um, I played a game called Magic the Gathering. People would beat me until I got really good at that. At a trumpet. I was good at the trumpet. I was the best trumpet player in my school. And I would have to play solos in front of a lot of people. And for some reason, the band director gave me solos that were way too difficult. And I failed at them. I messed them up probably 80% of the time, despite trying my absolute best. And I realized eventually that it is okay. All you can do is perform to your highest possible potential. And you are not always going to succeed. So now, what is actually failure? What is losing? What is failure? Well, failure is simply not trying your best, but I always tried my best. I'm not going to do something if I'm not going to try my best at it. Now, I may experiment with things and see if I am good at it, like uh, basketball. I played basketball for a season. I'm not good at basketball. So, you know what? I don't do basketball. I think there's definitely a lot of merit in learning how to quit quickly things that are not good for you. I have a little coffee on that. I think we did it on last week. Commit or quit, one of the two. Um, anyway, I think in general, 
you are going to want to... How did, where, are we, where are we going with this? Ah, yeah, get used to losing so you're not excited. Uh, that said, I realize a lot of you still will be excited. I get emails all the time from you all saying something like, oh man, I get so excited when I have a big hand or a big bluff or when I'm deep in a tournament, whatever. What's my suggestion to that? Well, really the answer is get a lot of experience and get used to it and realize all you can do is play your absolute best. So whenever you go to the game, ideally you don't want to get all worked up. If you are still getting worked up though, here's some things that can help you purely focus. For example, um, clear your plate. This is what I do. This is the main thing I do before I go and I play poker. I get all of my work done. And ideally, I get everything that I would otherwise need to do out of the way before I go to play poker. That way, when I'm playing poker, I don't have to worry about anything else. For me, this usually means dealing with emails, um, answering whatever questions you all have, making sure I have all my content made. For example, I'm in an interesting spot right now because I would normally be at the World Series of Poker right now. And what I do before the World Series of Poker, around March or April, typically, is I get all of my routine work done ahead of time. Like I write all the articles I need to write between now and August. I make all of my weekly Poker Hand episodes. I make all my poker coaching quizzes. I get everything I need to get done done so that I can focus on the World Series of Poker. When I'm at the World Series of Poker, I don't do much in terms of, um, well, poker-related business stuff besides meeting up with all of you in person and, you know, trying to be nice and happy and approachable, which is uh, sometimes more difficult said than done, especially after you bust a big tournament. But anyway, when I'm out of the World Series of Poker, I'm doing my best to just play good poker. It's, all, it's the only thing on my mind because that is my main priority. You want to make sure that poker is actually your priority, assuming you care about winning. Now, again, if you don't care about winning, then do whatever you want. For example, I remember watching uh, Jerry Buss, who owned the Lakers. He would be playing poker a lot during the World Series of Poker, and he would be on his phone for like a third of the day, standing up away from the table, talking on his phone. He had multiple people who would just keep bringing him phones. It was insane. And he, that's because poker was not the most important thing in the world to him, which makes logical sense, you know? You're not, he's not a professional poker player. He's playing for fun, and he has business to tend to. And, you know, that's okay. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, if the money you're playing for is substantial, should you be treating it as if it is substantial? And the answer is, well, yeah, right? If, see, the thing is, if Jerry Buss, who has, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars, is playing a $10,000 buying tournament, is it the most important thing in the world to him? The answer is obviously no. But if you're playing a $1,000 tournament and you have, I don't know, $40,000 to your name, it's a pretty big chunk of your bankroll and you should be very, very uh, disciplined with it. So ideally, you want to make sure your plate is clear so that other things are not pulling away your attention. Speaking of uh, pulling away my attention, I see a bunch of you asking random questions. This is not an Ask Me Anything today. We did that yesterday or two days ago. But I'll go through and answer the questions. Why not? Do you have a favorite meal before long sessions? No. Um, again, I don't do a whole lot of preparing and whatnot. Because um, I'm already prepared. My whole life has been preparation. If I didn't play a $2,500 terms, would I be up in dollars? Yes, of course. We'd be up, I don't know, 20 k or something. <laughs> Literally everything I'm... Actually, what am I? I'm down like 8K, I think, on the site. And I think I've lost... Well, what's uh, 2,500 times 7? 17,000? So it'd be up like 10K or something? But yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, up or down doesn't matter. All that matters is are you extracting equity? And we are. Do you ever watch streamers? Not really. who are some of my favorites. I like watching Michael Acevedo, but he streams in Spanish. Um, he's probably the best poker player who is streaming in terms of ability, EV. Um, he showed me some of his graphs. They're insane in terms of EV big blind per 100, which is all you can really do. So um, Michael Acevedo is my favorite to watch. You see me, when I was streaming the other day, I had Michael Acevedo pulled up on the side because it's good to glance over and see what he's doing. Let's see... I have no clue what you're even saying here. Are having, if, you, if you're having issues during the quizzes on the app, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we'll try to fix it. We want feedback on our app. If you have not tried our app yet, search Poker Coaching on the Android or iTunes app store. Am I a fan of MMA? Eh, not really. I don't really follow sports because if I follow sports, I may be inclined to bet on them, and I don't want to be betting on them. 
Um, that said, like I, I think MMA is an interesting, fun game. You said that your golf game was a major leak. I have no clue what you're... I don't even know what's happening here. I don't play golf. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Jerry Buss was always very nice to me. You're down 2,000 bucks on ACR. Join the club. Um, tips to improve your game. Go to pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals and study. To solvers betting check and frequencies, refer to a random roll number. Well, you can randomize your betting strategy in all sorts of ways. Lots of people roll a number. Lots of people, like me, don't worry about it. And just make the play based on how the hands fit into your range and your range advantage. We discussed that again, pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. You think poker is going to change drastically? I think it might become like six max or nine max. What should you do to prep? Realize the games are basically the same. We released four max charts to you the other day. Go to pokercoaching.com slash four max completely for free. Just for all of you. Um, we already have six max charts on the site. I, I don't think anything's going to change. Realize whenever you're playing like five-handed poker, just basically assume you're at a regular table and the first four or five people folded before the action's on you. There's no difference. Is it okay if you're more of a field player than a math player? Well, you have to understand, if you don't understand fundamentally sound poker, as you move up, you're going to get crushed because your feel is going to become irrelevant. You find off days help you stay focused. As you play less poker, you will probably be more focused when you do play, assuming you're still playing some. Because it's more important to you, right? How many times do you get counter? I don't know. Like irrelevant math pertaining to getting counterfeit and all that stuff doesn't really matter. Play good poker. What do you mean by up or down? It doesn't matter as long as you have the equity. Whenever you study your results using a program like Hold'em Manager, you can look at your EV big blind per hundred number. That tells you how much you'd be up or down if there was less luck. Basically, every time you get it all in, instead of winning or losing, you get your equity out of that pot. And if that number is consistently going up, then you're crushing the game. If it's going down, well, you're losing, right? And the question is, like, how fast is it going up? And, um, like, Michael Acevedo's is the highest I've ever seen, and which, which is amazing, right? High, a very high EV big blind per 100 in high stakes games, despite the fact that he, you know, still goes through the regular swings that everybody else does. Um, my number's, like, two-thirds of his, and which, is, which is still very good. Like, six big EV big blind per 100 is pretty solid. If your EV big blind per 100 is low, well, then you are playing in games that are too tough for you. But that will let you know if you are winning or losing. When I bust, do I feel the burn? No, I don't feel any burn. Let's see. All right, all right. You all are getting off topic. Number two, pregame routine. Once you're playing, how do you stay focused? Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. And it's very easy to get distracted. Number one distraction for most people is their telephone. It's their telephone. Whenever you are playing poker, ideally, you don't want to be on your phone. I've seen many players who used to be good who no longer have a reasonable win rate. And what happens to them is they used to be pretty good, but then they stopped paying attention. They started playing on Twitter all day or Facebook or whatever they're doing. And that takes away all of their attention. Now, some of these players may think, oh, I'm a good math player. The problem is, is that good math players and all good poker players make the most money by adjusting to whatever their opponents do incorrectly. So you want to make sure you're paying attention. Other things that can distract you are relationships. If you're having a fight with your significant other, that might be weighing on you. Some of you have significant others who don't like that you play poker. That's a big problem. You need to get on the same page and make sure you all want the same things in life if you are going to be living together and working together, right? Um, some of you may uh, be playing poker when you should not be playing poker, for example. Um, let's say your kids are having a dance recital today and you want to be there, but uh, there's also a poker tournament you'd rather play. If you decide to go to the poker tournament, inevitably, you are going to feel bad about that unless you're a sociopath. And maybe you picked the wrong thing. Realize it's not all about you and that you need to make sure that you are doing the right things in life. 
if you do the right things in life, then you will generally be at least somewhat happy. And understand that maybe, just maybe, poker is not the right fit for your life at this point in time. I've had to accept that things like Magic the Gathering are just not a right fit for this point in time in my life. And that is okay, right? Um, also, work can be a distraction. Ideally, you don't want your work calling you all the time. Um, bad self-talk can be a distraction. Some of you sit there and talk to yourselves all day saying things like, oh, you suck. You don't belong in this game. You should uh, quit the game, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you got to get that out of your head. You have to say good, nice things to yourself or just try to sit there and be calm and say nothing. I did an interview with Tommy Angelo the other day on YouTube. Check it out, youtube.com slash poker coaching, where we discuss just sitting there and be chill. Why are you addicted slash distracted by Hearthstone? Because it's designed to be addictive. All of these games on your phone are designed to make you addicted to them. They do this in all sorts of ways. But um, why are you addicted to it? Because you allowed yourself to get addicted to it and because uh, you started playing the game. Number one tip to most people for most things is to don't get started. People ask why I don't golf. Well, because I don't want to become addicted to it. And um, that's a problem. All right, next. We already discussed this already, but make sure poker is actually your priority. And that kind of leads into the idea that you have to hold yourself accountable for what you actually do at the poker table. If you lose your focus and you stop paying attention and you just make some blunder because you, like a silly mistake because you weren't paying attention, maybe you didn't know how many chips somebody had or maybe you didn't know what a bet size was or maybe you misread your hand or something absurd like that, you need to be very, very accountable for that, right? And... In my mind, the best way to hold yourself accountable is to review your hands after you play, but also to devote a lot of time to poker before you actually go to play poker. Because if you find that you spend, I don't know, half of your time studying and then half of your time playing, you're not going to want to squander your precious playing time. You've worked hard to get good at the game, and now when you actually go to implement the strategy that you have learned, you don't want to screw it up right? You want to make sure that you really, really care about what you're doing. And if you don't really, really care about it, then just for, like forget about the results. Realize you're doing it to pass the time. And it's okay to do things to pass the time. Um, it, it's important to realize that like, you, just, you don't have to go super hardcore on everything that you do. But if you're not going hardcore on it, don't expect to be good at it, right? So I personally have a bit of an issue where if I'm going to do something, I want to be good at it. I don't want to do something I'm going to be bad at. I don't like doing things that I just lose at consistently. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It doesn't, I don't want to pass the time. I want to make good use of my time. And I think a lot of you are probably that way. Um, Kevin says, like, golf is part exercise, part addiction. I would venture to say it's mainly socializing and hanging out and passing time, right? And... Um, Really, like what, uh, I'm thinking if we should even go into addiction today. We're not going to go into addiction. But essentially, like what is golfing? Golfing is trying to improve your high score, trying to beat your friends, maybe gambling, maybe drinking. Um, really, you're just chilling. You're chilling, right? It's not a strenuous thing. Sure, there's um, stress involved and whatnot, but it's like chilling. Chess is a quality addiction though. Again, like, so is chess actually productive for your life, assuming you're not going to be a professional chess player? There's nothing wrong with having hobbies, right? You should have hobbies. Um, but understand, like, you shouldn't be getting mad at yourself if you lose a chess game, if you're not taking chess seriously. And you say, but I, I study chess an hour a week. I'm taking it seriously. I don't want to lose. Well, if you study an hour a week and you're playing against people who devoted their life to it, then you're going to lose. I hate to break it to you. They're just going to crush you. I think a lot of people have unrealistic expectations for things that they are doing. And you need to get realistic about what is actually happening. Um, Hearthstone's a good example of this, right? You're not going to become a professional Hearthstone player. Even if you do, they don't make any money. So realize if you're playing that, it's purely for fun slash to pass the time. You have to ask, though, do I have so much 
free time am I already crushing life so hard to the point that I have time to waste on something that's not going to be actually beneficial for me lifetime. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. I think what actually happens though is you see the people who are actually doing very well at life, who have good relationships, who have plenty of money, who have a good job, who are fulfilled, they don't really waste a lot of their time. A lot of their free time is devoted back to getting good at their job or getting good at their relationships. And look, I've squandered plenty of time doing things that do not matter. Hearthstone's a good example. Magic the Gathering's a good example. Um, now, you, I almost justify these things to myself by saying, yeah, but they're strategy games. They rub off. They're kind of like poker. Worst case, they're teaching me strategy. But shouldn't I just be studying poker? You may say, but you don't like studying poker all the time. Look, we have cookies. We have cookies? Yeah. Where'd we get those? From Andrew. In the hall. That's ridiculous. Nice. You want to come say hi? You want to show them your cookies? Our neighbors asked for uh, some paper yesterday. They ran out, so I gave them some paper. Actually, they didn't ask. I just offered it to them. And now they decided to reward us with Girl Scout cookies. Are you so happy? Yeah. Yeah? Are you going to eat them? No. These are for the class. Oh, you're going to eat them at the class? No. Okay. I'm for the class. See ya. <sighs> Your enjoyment is too important. So that's really the question. Um, how do you learn to enjoy things that actually matter to you? Because you may enjoy doing something like playing Magic the Gathering, let's say. But it takes a lot of time. It um, takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of energy. I think you're going to find that most of the people who are crushing it just don't do those things. They find things that they enjoy that are also beneficial to their life. This could be um, hosting a podcast where you talk to smart, educated people who could perhaps, um, well, you could learn stuff from them, right? You could, um, well, learn games that you can actually make money at long term, like poker. Poker is a great one because in theory, you could actually crush it and get good. This is why I moved away from Magic the Gathering as an 18-year-old kid. I learned way back then you're not going to make any money from being a Magic the Gathering player. So I'm going to play poker. I like Magic the Gathering better than I like poker. But that's okay, right? You bet I have over a thousand viewers if I did this later in the day. Well, unfortunately, we have to build this around my life. Also, people watch the recording and we do get over a thousand viewers. We get, um, how many viewers do we get for this thing? 3,000 to 10,000 every day, somewhere in there? Let's see. Are you familiar with the Ivy case where you could see the cards or see the, well, he couldn't, his friend could um, see the defects in the cards. I'm familiar enough with it. There should still be some preparation, right? Football players prepare, all kind of professionals do. Well, if you're a football player, you have to get stretched and get fit and whatnot. They have pre-match routine as well, of course. So having to study off the table doesn't seem like a good excuse to not prepare. I'm always prepared. That's what you're missing, Muggy. I'm not... Um, Really, ideally, in the ideal world, like how, how would you even prepare for poker? Think about this. You can review some hands ahead of time. You can start thinking about poker ahead of time. You could do that, sure. You could um, meditate, get your mind clear, sure. Um, from talking to the mindset experts I know, they say I don't actually need to do a ton of these things. Why? Because I don't have all these crazy things going through my head naturally, right? I think a lot of people, a lot of people have a lot of issues in their head. They really do. Even a lot of very, very good poker players. I'm somewhat naturally kind of chill. We have lots of thought processes going on, but I'm not frantic. I'm not annoyed. I don't get angry at stuff. And if I do, it's subtle, right? As we talked about this the other day when we had my wife on the show. Like, if I ever do get annoyed, it's for like a split second. Like when you bluff the $2,500 tournament off, like we did the other day on the stream. Yeah, it's annoying, but... It's not going to impact my play. Just sit there and keep playing great. And the thing is, is like, especially when you're playing online poker, if you're very good at multi-tabling, you're just reading numbers and then playing accordingly. So as long as you take a second, read the numbers, make proper adjustments, and make the play, you're fine. And it seems like I'm pretty good at executing on that. Um, 
So anyway, I definitely have gone through periods of life where I was very hardcore about getting in good routines. Um, again, I'm talking purely for me, right? For most people, I think they are at that point where they really need to be doing it. Made about 20K. How would I recommend talk, taking, wait, talking about poker winnings with employers? Um, I probably just wouldn't. I probably just wouldn't. Maybe that's something you bring up in the interview if you actually do talk to people about it. If they say, like, so what'd you do last summer? Because you're in college, right? Say something to the effect of, I, um, to tell them that you play poker, right? Tell them you play poker and you won 20,000 bucks. People will like that. I would not list it on a resume as a job or anything like that. Let's see. You bought two of my books. Congrats. I hope you enjoy them. Did I play Command and Conquer? No. You have a win rate of 30 big blinds, I guess, for 100? I, I don't even know what you're asking here. What are good options to study besides these programs? Check out PokerCoaching.com. Yeah, if you didn't start chess early, you're, you're not going to get world class, that's for sure. Even then, the problem with, even if you do get world class at chess, what's the reward? This is really the issue. A lot of people like accolades. They like the respect of their peers, and they, they don't really, at their heart, care about winning money, which is fine. But you're going to find that there are a few things that give people problems in life. Finances is one of them, relationships, health, your um, you know, mental well-being, etc. And you know, while money doesn't cure all your problems, it cures your financial problems. And if you can just play a game that could also, or, or do something that could also cure your financial problems, you might as well. That way it's just one fewer thing that you have to worry about. Taking the fundamentals course now. Great. Hope you learn a ton from it. Is James the next Isildur? Probably not. Without, without being rude, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is you have to figure out how to make poker your main priority, assuming you care about actually being good at poker. And a lot of people do not make it their main priority, but they want or expect to have results as if it is their main priority. So figure out your priorities in life. And then do things to achieve those priorities, whatever it is. How important is Flopzilla for studying? It's relevant. I don't think it's like the most important thing. I think something like Equalabs just better. Only 40 likes. Come on, everyone. Clicking like is free. Indeed. Um, so as we should talk about stimulants, things like coffee, Coca-Cola, cocaine, um, I would definitely suggest you get off of stimulants, especially before you go to play poker. Very, very important. Um, what I do before any poker tournament series is I will just stop drinking coffee for like a week. And then when I go to play poker, I'll get back on it. And it turns out that if you get off of these things ahead of time, whenever you do need them, whenever you're getting a little bit lethargic at the poker table, they'll be helpful. Also, make sure you're in decent health, right? I guess I should make this clear because I'm sure some of you are going to say cocaine. Yeah, don't do cocaine. Don't do things that are just horribly detrimental to your body. That said, I think coffee is probably the right answer, as you see here. Um, I do not drink sodas or anything like this. The only drinks I drink are, well, red wine, probably not an ideal drink either. Water, coffee, and tea, although I've gotten off tea. I found that some teas would make my skin a little bit, like, rashy, raw. So I got off them. It turns out skin looks better now. Maybe we drink only coffee, water, and wine now. But um, the, there is the idea that you want to make sure you get off of these things so that they are very potent. What a lot of people do is they just are, they start on coffee, then they just start drinking lots of Coca-Cola, then they start drinking lots of Red Bull, then they start doing drugs, and they just keep ramping up until they wreck themselves. So you want to make sure you go through um, cycles where you don't completely wreck yourself. Um, so yeah, that's important. Where else are we going? Oh, being in good health, yeah. Um, you're going to find that if you're just generally in good health, you'll be able to sit there and focus better. I don't think you want to be ripped. 
you don't want to be in super sick shape because then you're going to need to eat all the time. Turns out if you have a lot of muscles, you have to eat a lot to sustain those muscles. And I don't think you want to, I don't think you want that necessarily. Um, but I do think you want to be in generally good shape. You want to feel good. You want your body to feel good. So that's just not another distraction, right? Is it possible some of the things discussed in Dr. Carter's course can help with preparation? Yeah, of course. Light exercise, mindful meditation, calling breaths. Yeah, all of that. Never caught me live though. Hello, Ryan. Glad you're here. Shout out to Big J. Right, wait, shout me out, Big J. Hello, Ryan. Right, there we go. I did it without even reading the thing. Um, is Ed Shorting cheating? Um, I don't know how they define cheating. Clearly, the courts said it was cheating. I think, personally, if you go to the casino and they present you a game, even if you ask for specific things in that game, like a special deck of cards, if they say sure, then, in my mind, nothing you do there is cheating. Um... What about using an electronic device? Another good question, right? Do you have to use only your brain? I don't know. Um, I think electronic devices are probably out of line because the casino doesn't know you have it. But if you tell the casino, hey, I'm gonna use this electronic device right here while I play, is that cool? And they say, sure, that's fine. Then there should be no problem. As far as I know, Phil Ivey asked for special decks of cards. He asked for Mandarin Dealer and he asked for his friend who spoke Mandarin to speak to the dealer in Mandarin and ask them to move the cards around because those made it, that made it lucky or something like that. Um, so I guess there was a lie there that it didn't make it lucky or maybe it did make it lucky. You want a lot of hands in me. Um, it basically let them know there was a defect in the cards that they requested that the casino provided and um, the way it was, the way they were cut made it to where you could slightly tell the difference in low cards to high cards if the cards were turned around opposite directions. So anyway, they knew what cards were coming. Is it uh, cheating to know what cards are coming? You could certainly, certainly venture to say that if you know what cards are coming, that is cheating. Um, but I do, I do not. I think you should have been paid by the casino. The casino provided the game. I think the casino should get their act together and not provide games that are not in their favor. Right? That's what casinos do. They provide games that are in their favor, and it sets a very bad precedent that if the casino just thinks you're cheating. Or you, if you even somehow just get an advantage on them because they present, presented a game that was bad for them, that they can just take your money back. It kind of, the, the law or the uh, decision essentially presumes that casinos do not have to play without a disadvantage. Is the poker coaching site down? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe it is, though. If it is, it'll come right back up. Again, 30 big blind win rate, good. Yes, 30 big blind win rate is good and per 100 hands, clearly, yes. Something like five or six is good. You probably have a very small sample, though. In tournaments where the prize is such that you don't care that much about min cash and compared to tournaments where the min cash is significant, how does that change your game? Well, min cash is always roughly the same amount, right? Unless you're playing a satellite or something. So you may say that you're playing a small buy-in tournament so you don't care about the min cash. doesn't work like that. You should be treating all games the same. What's the best way to study the hands? I go through lots and lots of hands, and I essentially try to find things after the fact that I don't think we're necessarily ideal. Also, if you want to like go into database analysis, we have a, we have a coach, Alexander Fitzgerald at PokerCoaching.com who does a lot of this. Um, but essentially he, well, he, he looks for, for common spots where he knows you should be like, let's say check raising X percentage. If you're not, it presumes maybe you're doing something wrong. Not necessarily, but maybe. Also, you want to look for spots where you think you're profitable, but you're clearly not. Like say you look at every uh, King Jack offsuit you play from under the gun and it's unprofitable, yet you play it every time. That's elite. Don't play the King Jack offsuit. Just start folding, right? So you want to look for spots where you're like just definitively losing money, where you, where the alternative is like zero, right? You can fold for free, or you can you know play the hand and lose some amount of money. You'd rather just fold for free. Louis Flute says you have a little trick in your study group. You play. We like to play video games, so while we play, we turn off the game sounds and listen to poker coaching videos. Genius. There you go. Make good use of it. Is starting poker early in life important like chess? Um, I don't think so, and that's because people don't take poker as seriously as they take chess. I don't even know what this is asking, Stefan. Ah, you're saying that you made, you played poorly at the table and you wouldn't make that when you were not stressed. This is the kind of stuff that pregame routine will help with. I feel like I, this is the issue I don't think I actually have, right? Essentially, you want to make sure that you are playing as well as you know how to play when you are playing. 
What happens to a lot of people is they know the right play, they just don't do the right play. Um, good example the other day when I was playing online where we punted off our stack in the $2,500 tournament on a triple barrel bluff, bet, bet over Jam River, common spot. A lot of people wouldn't do it. They would have checked. And you know, I lost the hand, I lost the tournament, but we probably extracted some EV by making that play. And it's the right play. You're not always gonna get the result you want in any of these scenarios, but it's, if it's the right play, then you just have to do it. And if you find yourself making errors, like you maybe you're not paying attention as well, maybe you, um, I don't know, something's just happening where you like, care about the money or something in game, yeah, that's a mistake. And um, that's a lack of not fully understanding what you should do and why, and then realize, not understanding fully that when you don't make that play, you are giving money to your opponents. You are literally giving your money away. Let's see. Again, it's very important to realize what I think about a legal case does not matter. I'm not the judge. How do you get out of mental ruts and get back to your performance? Study and learn how to play very, very well. Red wine improves heart health in men surprisingly. Listen, there's a book I read called This Naked Mind that talked about Lots of studies done by, um, well, lots of studies that come out. Turns out the vast majority of them are paid for by alcohol companies. Also, studies like this say you can have one glass per day. I know I sure don't have one glass when I have it. That's for sure. And um, a lot of people try to justify their poor behavior by citing whatever they can. And there's a whole lot more studies that say that alcohol wrecks people's lives than that it helps your heart, right? So in theory, I think I'd rather just get off it. Why not then do it? I don't know, I like it. Maybe we're addicted again. Um, that said, we're not drinking a ton. Back in the day, why do you search for a private coach? I, anytime I'm gonna learn anything, do I get a private coach, even today? Right? If I'm trying to learn any new game, I get a private coach. I certainly don't think I have all the answers. But why would I get a private coach? Because I want to get all of their knowledge put into my brain as fast as I can. And if I can spend 10 hours with them and learn 80% of what they know, that's well worth it because it would otherwise take me 1,000 hours to learn it myself. Private coaching in, in everything is perhaps the best use of money and time that you could possibly do, even if it's expensive because they will get you through all the common hurdle, all the common uh, barriers, pitfalls, et cetera, that you would otherwise run into. And because they've done it all before, right? I mean, it's just like a no brainer to get private coaching for anything. And I realize some private coaching for things like poker is expensive because poker players make a lot of money playing poker if they're good, which is why I made my site, pokercoaching.com. Go there, take the quizzes. The quizzes are just like private coaching sessions. Let's see, is it possible to make poker a profitable hobby? Yes, all you have to do is find players you can beat and then play with them a lot. You wish you'd met me when I was 18. I wish I met me when I was 18 as well. <laughs> all right, you spend 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Wait, okay. You're at the stage where there's so much content on my site, you don't know what to focus on. Well, ask yourself, where are you having problems? And also realize you don't have to get through all content. It's okay to only go through some of the content, but you wanna find things that are causing you problems and study them. You'd like to train yourself for recurring ICM situations. What do I recommend? There's a site called ICMizer. Go to jonathanlillpoker.com slash ICM, I think. Maybe ICMizer. It'll take you there. It's a good program to study ICM situations. Any recommendations for thing to listen to, things to listen to on your two-hour drive? One of my books. Many of my books are on Audible. Bad precedent that the Apostle case gets dismissed. Well, the Apostle case is not over. It seems like a lot of people think that for some reason, just because it gets dismissed from the lowest possible court that it's dismissed, that's not how the, government, the judicial system works. They will continue trying. But yeah, it's not ideal that uh, they already said that... Well, to be fair, I don't think they necessarily... 
I think they, they, they did a few things wrong. Poker News wrote an article about it. Go read it. I'm not going to go through that. I'm not a lawyer. Basically, they did not specifically say the damages that were caused. I think that was one of the issues. But I, I don't know. Oh, my God. You all keep asking me the same question over and over again. I've already answered. If I see that question again, I'm banning that person. All right. Shout out to Louis Philippe. You think you're overvaluing Ace King and Ace King suited preflop? Go through your database and look, right? Keep good notes. You want to be playing $100 sit and goes? You start at $30 and grind it up. You immediately start playing higher and higher, et cetera, et cetera. How can you stop this? Don't be a degenerate. Keep 100 buy ins for your game. If you don't have 100 buy ins for your sit and goes, you cannot move up. So you cannot play $100 sit and goes until you have $10,000. Okay? There you go. If you have 100 bucks right now, you can play $1 sit and goes. When you get to um, 500, you can play $5 sit and goes. Do that, be disciplined, and you will um, probably succeed at poker long term or lose a little bit of money. Travis, you're very welcome. Ryan DePaulo has entered the chat. Hello, Ryan DePaulo. Hope you're having a great day. Let's see, let's see. If you all are watching this on Instagram, by the way, if you're watching it at youtube.com slash poker coaching, you can see the chat. You can see whatever else I want to show all of you. Instagram makes it difficult to show things, though. So. Mark Lovin, good morning, good morning. Let's see. Staying focused at the table. Let's get back on topic. Because um, you all get me off focus. Whenever you are playing... A lot of people get it in their heads that once they fold, they're kind of done with the hand. And that's not true. You want to make sure you're actively paying attention to everything that's going on at the poker table. And you want to be putting people on ranges consistently. If you are not putting people on ranges while you're at the poker table, then you are leaving money on the table because you're not thinking about what they are doing. And sometimes you're going to be surprised by what they show up with. And if you don't follow the hand, if you don't um, keep track of what's going on, inevitably what's going to happen is you're not going to be picking up as many reads as you possibly could. And that's going to result in you not winning as much money as you possibly could. So always make sure you pay attention. Now, when you're playing a bunch of tables online, obviously that goes out the window. But at that point, you're paying attention to the stats on the screen, assuming you're using a hold a manager type program. And that will essentially pay attention for you. So it's your job to just synthesize the information. And uh, I think a lot of people know they're supposed to be adjusting, but whenever they're playing live poker, they just don't pay attention. So they do not know how to adjust. Um, at the end of the day, all you really have to do is just adjust to what your opponents are doing very incorrectly. And things like Hold'em Manager make that easy online because they tell you what your opponent's doing incorrectly if you know how to utilize that information. But in live poker, you need to pay attention. So going back to like how to stay focused you need to make a game out of putting people on ranges whenever you are playing live poker so many people they'll be watching sports or you know betting on sports and sweating out the games on their phone or they'll be talking with their friends or they'll be sexting someone or who knows what they're doing and that will inevitably distract them from the game at hand and i'm not perfect at this uh, no one's perfect at this i don't think i'm not saying you want to sit there and be very, very intently staring down everyone the whole time. But you do want to make sure you are trying to put people on ranges and trying to make a puzzle out of every situation that you are in. And if you make a game out of putting people on ranges, that's just like one more fun thing you can do at the table. So I definitely think that is something you all should make sure you work into your poker experience, right? Assuming, again, you're trying to win. Um, you may find that that means you do a little bit less talking. You do a, bit, a little bit less um, playing on your phone. You do a little bit less gambling on stuff and sweating it out. But in exchange for doing those things a little bit less, you'll have a higher win rate. And you'll be able to see things that um, your opponents do wrong, and then you can adjust accordingly. If you don't know how to adjust, again, check out pokercoaching.com. We actually have a tournament challenge going on right now where every day for the next 30 days, I will give you something to do. And... Usually takes 30 minutes to an hour, but if you go through that for the next 30 days, you will get good at studying poker and you will inevitably get better at poker and you'll have better results out the door. Does studying psychology help me master poker? Not at all. The stuff they taught us about psychology in school is completely useless. 
Oh, let's see. Seems like your opponents are leading out with nothing, I guess. If your opponents are leading out with nothing very frequently, then raise them with your best hands. I'm sorry, raise them with your worst hands, with your bluffs. Call them with your nuts. Right? Always ask, what, what beats this strategy? I mean, that should be clear. We talk about this a lot at poker coaching, but you want to make sure you are doing whatever crushes your opponent's strategy. So let's say your opponents lead every time they have garbage on uncoordinated boards. If you have something like top pair good kickers and better, if the top pair is high, like jack or higher, then just call because you want them to stay in the pot because they're drawing pretty near dead. If you have nothing or a draw or a vulnerable made hand, you'd rather raise and just win the pot immediately. But if your opponents are literally going to lead only with garbage or the majority of the time with garbage, just raise them every time. Life's easy. Good Sarah recommends putting your phone on airplane mode. Yeah, I put it in my uh, in my backpack or my bag that I bring when I'm playing. You think you overvalue trackers because you play very profitable at mid-stakes without a heads-up display. Understand what, what a ridiculous statement that is. Understand what a ridiculous statement that is purely because something you have not even tried. If you think something... Is, if you've not even tried something, there's no way in the world... You should think you have experience that the other people have. And um, also, I'm like 20 tabling when I'm playing. When you're 20 tabling, you have two options. You can either use a heads up display and adjust accordingly, or just play straight good GTO poker. Straight good GTO poker will win less money than adjusting. And also, you don't, even if you have like 100 hands on someone, just knowing if they're loose or tight before the flop is beneficial. Um, certainly there are people who don't use heads-up displays, and they're, they're fine. You'll find that most of them can't play very many um, hands, or they can't play very many tables, right? This is the same person who asked earlier, does it strictly have to be 100 buy-ins for heads-up sit-and-goes? Absolutely no less. Look, you do whatever you want, right? I'm telling you, if you have a problem with being a degenerate, where you always want to move up and press the stakes and try to get rich quick, you're always going to be broke. If you play parlays, and you parlay like crazy all the time, which is exactly what you're doing, you're going to be broke for pretty much your whole life. Every once in a while you're coming to money, but then you'll just keep playing higher and you'll lose all that too. So if you have to have 100 buy-ins to play the games and you're really strict and diligent about it, then you'll get there. And, and uh, yeah, so I realize a lot of sites do not allow heads-up displays, which is good for the bad players. It turns out that when you take away the skills of the good players their win rates go down. Which is why some of the sites like um, World Series of Poker, Party Poker, etc., instead of like jacking up the rake and making the games very luck-based, like um, sites like PokerStars do, which also, that diminishes the edge of the good players, um, World Series of Poker, Party Poker, etc., keep the rake low, keep structures good, but they get rid of heads-up displays, which turns out kills the good player's edge about as much as raising the rake does. Um... Feels way better though, right? Because you're still playing poker and it's on a fair level playing field and the rate's not high, etc., etc. And um, like if you if you if you ask yourself which would you prefer the sites to, obviously you'd rather just get rid of the heads up displays and not make all games unbeatable across the board, or at least the majority of games unbeatable across the board. Will this stream be saved for later? Yeah, all of these streams are available at YouTube.com/slash/PokerCoaching. Why do people argue the answer they get? If you weren't prepared for the answer, don't ask the question. I mean, look, it's, um, uh, to be fair, you should argue the, the answer. If you don't like my answer, that's fine. Rick Flair keeps going on about how he has good results. Understand, I don't really care because I'm not saying you can't have good results without a heads-up display. Plenty of people have good results in medium stakes and small stakes games without a heads-up display. Some people have good results in high stakes games without a heads-up display. I will tell you, though, that I'm an advisor to a backing company and every single player they have uses a heads-up display because they have clearly determined that it is more profitable to have more information than less information. How do you unbecome a degenerate? That's a tough one. It's a tough one. You have to stop playing for the money. You have to stop playing to try to get rich. You have to find a process, follow the process, like I just gave the process of keep 100 big blinds or 100 buy-ins for your um, for your game, and you have to develop discipline, right? And if you are a degenerate, you essentially lack discipline. And 
you have to get that in your life. And it's easy to do it with games like poker. You just set rules and do not break them. If you break them, you quit playing forever. Obviously, that's a very strict rule. That's the end game rule. Um, it's, um, you, you have to be strict with yourself. You have to be accountable for your actions. And if you're not, well, then you're kind of stuck, right? It, it's, it's a tough thing. If you're not accountable for your actions and you don't have essentially, uh, you know, like good, I mean, it's going to sound bad. I don't, I don't think ethics is the right word, but if you have bad ethics, if you lie to yourself and do things that you know you should not be doing, then you're probably going to fail. And I don't want you to fail. I want you to succeed, which is why I'm giving some rules. Like someone says, I try to parlay every time I play. They recognize this is bad. What's the fix? The fix is always keep a hundred buy-ins. If you don't have a hundred buy-ins, you don't get to play period. I did this my entire poker career. And now I have plenty of money. And it's not because I'm the best poker player in the world. It's because we are disciplined and we did not try to get rich fast. You have to understand, I turned $50 into $350,000 in three years without ever buying in for more than $200. Think about that. Also, I never had a score for more than $1,000. We were playing a lot of sit and goes with many, many buy ins. I tried to keep about 250 buy ins at least. And we were never going to go broke, and uh, life was great. And even then, for live terms, we still try to keep a very big bankroll. It's very, very important to have discipline. That's why you're here. You do lack discipline. You've been working on it. Yeah, and you have to realize that you are going to fail sometimes. Um, but have repercussions, right? And, and make sure that you are making good decisions. That's a lot of sit-and-go grinding. Yeah, it was. I played about 3,000 to 5,000 games a month, every month, for three years. Turns out, you just sit there and grind it out, you'll make money. All you have to do, I'm telling all, all of you this, all you have to do is find a game you can beat and then play it a lot. You always get real up and then you always blow it. Well, figure out how and why you're blowing it. You're breaking even. At what point should you be concerned with your EV is a downswing rather than your results? Um, so if you're supposed to be like down even more, look, your EV big blind per hundred range or uh, line or results are pretty active, especially in cash games. So if like, say the results say you're supposed to be like way in the dumpster, but you're actually breaking even, you're probably not very good and you need to study a lot. Does the hundred big blinds also apply for cash games? Listen, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll and read that. That's all the bankroll advice you could possibly need. What is your losing rate in cash games? I'm not sure what you mean. When you decide to leave the poker table when losing. Go to johnflowpoker.com slash bankroll and read that. I have to go now. Instagram's telling me I have to pack it up. Hope you all have a great day. Hope you enjoyed this. If I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. I'll be back again on Monday. Seems like you all like asking me anything. And Mondays are always a rough day because I will have been up all night playing online poker. Are Sundays the best day to play online? Yes. Absolutely. I only play on Sundays. Sunday afternoons, Eastern time, are where it's at online if you can only play for 12 hours. So I'll see you bright and early Monday. We'll have asked me anything. Think of your questions, and I'll be here to discuss them with you. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Thank you very, very much for everything you do for me. Click like, click subscribe. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash tournament challenge to improve your poker skills today. Do not squander your time. Figure out what you want in life and get it.